blood sugar balances everything it is a foundational aspect of all healing one that decides how other interventions are effective in today's episode we answer three key questions what is true blood sugar control why is balancing blood sugar so important who benefits from blood sugar control Monica Paz is a functional medicine certified nutritionist with a master of science degree in human nutrition. She studied dietetics and worked as a registered dietitian. She is the owner of Nourished Functional Nutrition, her virtual practice where her focus is to help people balance their blood sugar using the principles of functional medicine. She discovered functional nutrition and its focus on root cause medicine during a health crisis. She is passionate about helping people transform their health one bit at a time. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I am Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, Author and Youth. Gini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Monica, welcome to the Sleep Whisperer podcast. A pleasure to have you and you are such an inspiration to me personally. And today we are talking about blood sugar control and the sleep connection, a hugely important topic. Uh, and I explored this couple of years ago with another common friend of ours, Mindy. Uh, but I think you bring a very unique perspective into blood sugar and the little bits of information that you share each time are so powerful. So I would love to talk about how blood sugar plays this key role in all of sleep because, you know, uh, how do we know that we are having blood sugar fluctuations? It's so common to hear people saying that I wake up every night at a particular time and I'm sure you'll have lots of insights to share with reference to this. But maybe just get us started a little bit about why are you so passionate speaking into this area of blood sugar and of course it's important to all health but what drew you to it thank you so much for having me deepa i really appreciate your taking the time to invite me and i'm honored to be here so um just to begin the reason why i'm so passionate and as you know I I feel like my life is going into this work. And the reason for that is because from a young age, I saw my father uh, suffering from diabetes and I always wanted to help him. He did not have any interest in taking care of himself. And I could never answer the question. He would say, you got to die of something. And I could never have a good answer for that. And I feel like now I have that answer. And that answer came as he was dying. And he was agonizing for four years in extreme pain with neuropathy that we couldn't even hold his hand when he was dying. He was on dialysis. He was on a tube feeding. He was almost blind. And he wanted to die, but he couldn't die. And when I saw that picture, I vowed to myself that I would never go through that or allow any of my loved ones or anyone that I know to go through that. And so it comes from my heart to bring this information to people because 
blood sugar control is not only at the root of pretty much every chronic illness, but it is also so preventable, yet there isn't enough attention brought to the subject from physicians and health practitioners. And so I want to be that voice that brings out this important topic to the world. And I want to make sure that I make a difference in people's lives. Oh, and you're absolutely doing that, Monica, and making us all so proud of you. And I'd like for us to now talk about what is blood sugar control? Is it something that we need to check? Do we just know from a feeling in our body or mind? If you could just walk us through that. Let's say that somebody does not want to or does not have access to blood sugar monitoring devices because there's a lot spoken about today about the CGM but I personally have a lot of clients who don't want to go down that route of monitoring all the time so is there a way that how do we know that we have blood sugar control well as I said before blood sugar affects everything and so when we start seeing these symptoms of anxiety, irritability, uh, what people call hangry. You know, I started with that when I was very young. I felt like I had hypoglycemia and it's kind of, uh, it's very common, but it's not normal to have hypoglycemia. And we all look around at our friends and we go, oh, hangry. And we all laugh about it. And we say, oh yeah, get her some food because she's going to snap. That is a symptom of blood sugar irregularity or not being in control of your blood sugar. And if we really start to listen to our bodies and start really getting inside and thinking about how we're feeling, we are not well when our blood sugar is not under control. And so all it takes is, you know, your physical, if you go to your physical and you see that your blood sugars are out of range, just to the top of the scale. If your physician says everything is normal, look at those numbers, look at the ranges. Are you on the top of the range? Or are you at the bottom of the range? Are they calling you pre-diabetic? Are they saying that you're insulin resistant? Do you have um, fat accumulation around the middle? Are you feeling like you can't button your pants? All of these are symptoms of blood sugar dysregulation, and then add to that, are you sedentary? Are you using a lot of processed foods, a lot of sugar? All that kind of comes hand in hand. And because we're talking about sleep, the most important thing that we could possibly do in our lives is your sleep being affected. Is Those are major, major symptoms of blood sugar dysregulation. And Monica, I'm just going to ask you on that note. So what does that look like? Is it that somebody struggles to fall asleep? Is it that they wake up? Does it look different for everybody? It's going to look different for everybody because we're all individuals. And in some cases, someone may have blood sugar dysregulation and they may be extremely anxious. And so at bedtime, their cortisol curve is going to be affected. So they're going to have this feeling of anxiety where their mind is busy and they can't fall asleep. But mostly, a lot of people have this waking up in the middle of the night wide awake. Why are we feeling wide awake? Because cortisol is the hormone gets, get, that gets triggered when our blood sugar drops. Why is our blood sugar dropping? Because when we go to bed and our blood sugar is elevated, anything that goes up is going to come down. So as that blood sugar comes down in the middle of the night, cortisol goes up and cortisol wakes us up so that our liver starts creating sugar to maintain that glucose control. And that takes a couple hours out of our sleep nights. And, and that's what keeps us awake and keeps us. And so there's the cycle of cortisol. And, and for me, cortisol was uh, that feeling of anxiety, but also that irritability and the confusion of, do I have low blood sugar 
or am I anxious? Because the symptoms mimic each other. And uh, Monica, I think that, you know, you mentioned your father and diabetes and some of the common things that you hear from a lot of people is that I'm not a diabetic, so I don't need to look at my blood sugar. So I'd love for you to clarify this for us, and especially since you spoke so much about sleep, that why is balancing our blood sugar so important, even if we are not diabetics? That topic is so, so interesting because um, when you look at the statistics of blood sugar control or people who are have either metabolic syndrome, hypoglycemia, diabetes, insulin resistance, uh, pre-diabetic, any of these have had gestational diabetes, that comprises about 8.9% or 8.9 out of 10 adults in the U.S., so that's basically nine out of us, out of 10 of us have blood sugar dysregulation. So what does that mean? That means is the majority of the population is affected by this. We don't have to have this diagnosis because as you know, when we go to a physician, there's very little time in front of that doctor and they're looking at major diagnoses. They're looking at something that they can put a label on. If you are not yet diabetic and you don't need to take medication, your doctor's going to say, your blood sugar is a little elevated. We're going to watch it. It's no, not through any fault of their own. That's just the way the medical model works. We wait until the diagnosis comes to do something about it, which is the tools that physicians have in their training is medication and um, surgery. And so those are the things that they focus on, but that is not to say that there are not things that we can all do to take our health into our own hands. And by when I say that, it doesn't mean you're going to never go to a doctor, but we need to understand that there are things that we can do and we can teach our children to do. And Deepa, the way I see this is this is life-changing to a point that we can change generations. We can change our family trees by changing the way that we eat. And this is like the low hanging fruit. This is the place where we can make the most difference in our health and that of our loved ones. Because what I see is that when people change their eating habits and they start eating nutrient dense foods and they start moving their bodies, their children will follow and their children will follow. And it's a generational thing. It's, it affects, I have an assistant who lives in a different state. She's a virtual assistant and she, um, she and I started working together and she was getting sick all the time. And it was like every couple of weeks she had a fever and a cold and she was in bed and all these things. She started working with me and just by helping me put together all of my handouts and things that I share, she started making changes and took one of my courses that I was offering and she said everything changed at home. Pretty soon her daughter, her 14 year old daughter came up with a smoothie bowl that she had made and she wanted her mom to take a picture of it. So I put her on, the, on my Instagram to show this generational impact and then I said to my my assistant, I said, Amanda, have you noticed that in the last six months you have not had one cold? And she said, I hadn't noticed. She hadn't noticed, but it had already passed on to her daughter. Not only that, she also has three virtual assistants that she she has like an agency, and one of them was obese. And uh, just by hearing her talk about blood sugar control and all these things, this woman lost 80 pounds, never even speaking to me, just a hearsay. And so that's the kind of power that we all have on our environment. And so you're describing, Monica, that every one of us can benefit from prioritizing, balancing our blood sugar. So I really want to 
go into the practical aspects of this. So maybe if we could first talk about what would poor blood sugar control look like in terms of eating through the day. Uh, so what are the typical triggers that tip us over? And then we can talk about how do we build something during the day which supports regulated blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the most important things that people do during the day is, is the beginning of their day. And unfortunately, in our country, when we look at the typical American breakfast, is full of either sugar or refined carbs. So you have the muffins, the pancakes, the toast with jam, the orange juice, the cereal, the milk, all of that is going to trigger a blood sugar spike. And so what we're trying to do here is to regulate that blood sugar spike so that it's not so high. And the way that that we do that is, well, first of all, you asked to, to say that the typical thing that you would do that would increase the blood sugar would be eating frequent meals. And that's what I used to do when I started trying to regulate my blood sugar. I had been taught that you had to eat frequent small meals throughout the day. And my go-to was cheese and crackers, yogurt and fruit, fruit. And my blood sugar was up and down all day long. And that's what happens is you have this trigger that forces a lot of insulin into your bloodstream. And the insulin that takes care of the sugar is overreacts. So the, the pancreas overreacts, you have a big um, secretion of insulin, and then you become insulin resistant. So you're eating these meals, these small meals throughout the day, trying to regulate when in reality is keeping you elevated. And I think that's such a wise point, Monica, because a large part of the nutritional world, even in India, very popular health practitioners advocate for eating every two hours. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is so far away, even from what ancient wisdom advises that never eat beyond three meals and keep give the gap between meals and I was so glad to hear you say that because everybody I know and they are talking about I eat small meals through the day and then they have so many symptoms and this is so much in our hands. So much in our hands and just knowing what to do is so simple yet it has been made so complicated by all of this information that is out there in the media. And I'm not here to say that I'm the expert, but I have been through it and, and I struggled with it for so long and it's now working. So what I do is I share that with my clients and the public. And that is, what can you do? So for example, mistake that I was making myself, I would leave my house after eating a bagel with cream cheese and some orange juice. And I knew that I was going to have that drop in the middle of the day. And 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, I would eat a mandarin orange. And so, yes, it has some fruit or it has some fiber in it, but it's mostly sweet. And so that would carry me for maybe an hour. Then I would have, let's say, a sandwich with potato chips. And so all of these are like that refined carb, not enough protein, and just definitely only vegetables at night because you don't have time and you're in a big hurry and all that. And, um, and we don't really know where to turn. We don't really know what to do with that. And uh, I would carry cheese sticks in my pockets to try to, to help that. But the main thing is to make sure that we have fiber in our diet, that we have fiber in the form of vegetables lots and lots of plant foods, protein, and healthy fats. We have become so afraid of fat, and fat actually regulates, healthy fats regulate the blood sugar. And I must ask you this, Monica, because this is a huge topic today in the popularity of whole food plant-based diets. Um, and I mm -hmm. think there's a world of difference between being a healthy vegan and the whole food plant-based diet advocates for 
not using any fats in the form of oils because they're considered processed, but you use fats only as yes. the olive as a whole or a coconut. Uh, so no oils, no ghees, no extra virgin olive oil, uh, no coconut oil. Um, and, and all respect for anybody who's choosing that path. This is not about that. I'm just trying to understand it in the context of blood sugar regulation. So would you say that if we don't have, um, I guess what I'm asking is that, do you think fats behave the same way, whether they're just olives or versus olive oil? Because to me, the olive oil, while it's a processed version of the olives, it's a more concentrated fat. Uh, so what would you what would you think about that? And so what we need to understand, first of all, is that every single person is unique and everyone is going to respond differently. And that's why, you know, as a general statement, you can't say this thing is good or this thing is bad or this diet is good or this diet is bad because as you know, Deepa, we all have this unique environment where some people love to eat paleo and other people like to eat vegan and they feel healthy. They feel healthy. And so that's why I really um, encourage people to learn how to monitor their blood sugar. I know it's not within everyone's reach, but whenever they have a chance to not be afraid to check their blood sugars. And here in the US, monitors are so inexpensive and every every household should have a monitor. Every, I Just to give you an idea, one night we had sweet potatoes for dinner and I thought, oh, I'm going to check my blood sugar. So I checked my blood sugar. It was 195. And I turn around to my husband. I said, let me check your blood sugar because he we had the exact same thing. His blood sugar was 95. And I was like, what is up with that? And so you can say, oh, yeah, eat this and eat that and you're going to be regulated. You won't be regulated unless you know where your blood sugars stand. I think and that makes just so much in. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as a whole, if you add some fat with a carbohydrate or with a salad, for example, you're going to have, well, no, I'm, I'm going to say with a carbohydrate, a carbohydrate with a fat or with a, with a fiber, the blood sugar is going to regulate better than if you had that carb all by itself, even if it's a sweet potato, which is a plant nourished or nourishing meal, it's going to uh, tend to spike you. Let's, I think we don't have too much time, Monica, but I would love to go through food. So what does a typical breakfast, lunch, dinner look like when we want to have great blood sugar regulation? And I know this is unique. We just spoke about that, how it can play out differently. But maybe as a broad framework for all of us, what are the examples that we could eat? Okay, so uh, let's think about kind of the framework, like you said, of what are we aiming for? And the latest research, which is so exciting, shows that fiber is a wonderful thing to have ahead of all the other meals. And so, for example, if you're going to have a lunch or a dinner or even breakfast and you have a choice of the order in which you're going to eat the food, when you eat your vegetable first, anything that has plant fiber in it, that is going to slow down the release of sugar. So the objective is to really, to slow down the release of sugar as much as possible. So the fiber and the protein and the fat are going to have that effect on the blood sugar regulation, the blood sugar release. And by slowing that down, then you're going to have blood sugar regulation. So for example, let's think about a breakfast. So let's say a uh, typical breakfast in the US, eggs. Add some vegetables to those eggs. 
how about some spinach or mushrooms or onions or something like that to slow down to provide that fiber and then have perhaps some coconut yogurt with the berries at the end of the meal. That is the one, the one uh, tip that I can give people is to try to get that fiber in first because that slows down the release of sugar. Secondly, the other piece of um, research that has been found is the effect of apple cider vinegar on the on blood sugar control. The fact that some people, again, not for everyone, um, just one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and four ounces of water ahead of meals is going to decrease the blood sugar uh, release. And so that's really exciting because that really helps a lot of people to control their blood sugar. And number three would be movement after exercise, which people, I have posted about this and some people have some crazy ideas about, oh, I can't move because I'm going to get appendicitis. And there are a lot of wife sales about movement, but I'm not talking about going to run a marathon or playing professional football, nothing like that. I'm talking about a gentle walk after dinner, that kind of thing. If you check your blood sugar before dinner, after dinner, and then after a walk, totally different. Like your blood sugar is going to come down to baseline after a meal and a walk versus just eating the meal and sitting on the couch. And Monica, you know, even the ancient Ayurvedic texts talk about this, that taking thousand steps after every meal uh, is a healthy habit, that after every single meal, you must have movement. So it's amazing when this ancient wisdom correlates with modern science. It always just baffles it's... me how they got it right so far back. Um, but do talk us through, you gave some beautiful examples of breakfast. Um, I would love to also give a plant-based option if you can suggest something and then also give some broad framework for lunch and dinner. And I think that's all we'll have time for today. Okay, so one thing that is so exciting to me is to know Vaish because she has introduced me to dosas. She has introduced me to so many things with legumes that you can do. But one thing that I absolutely love is to make a pancake with garbanzo flour and vegetables. So same thing, instead of eggs, garbanzo flour, a little yogurt, and some seeds or some nuts for dessert with some berries. I would do the berries with the coconut yogurt and some nuts with that pancake. I love traveling with that because I make my pancakes. I roll them up, I put them in my bag, and then I'm in on the plane. Don't have to worry about refrigeration or anything. It's just wonderful. So that would be a lunch. Um, I'm sorry, that would be a breakfast. A lunch would be a bowl. I love I call it a protein bowl, and all it is is you line it up with all kinds of uh, leaves, and you could do quinoa or rice or lentils, beans, garbanzos, and then just pile on the shredded carrots, shredded beets, uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, anything you love, and then nuts, seeds, and a good dressing, and that that would be a nice plant based. Uh, lunch. And I then for saw dinner. a beautiful one you shared and my mouth was watering because it had white beans, which I just love. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a beautiful bowl you shared recently. Yeah, I think that's amazing. and gives us such a broad framework to play around with, with so many different uh, alternatives to each of those. Yes. And then we can make any kind of a uh, bean or tofu soup or you know like a like a curry for example for dinner with some rice and I I the way I eat rice this is another thing is as a resistant starch because a resistant starch feeds the gut bacteria in the colon it bypasses the small intestine it does not spike the blood sugar so resistant starch is cooled uh, cooked and cooled uh, rice potatoes, uh, overnight oats, 
green bananas, any of these things can be eaten without worrying about your blood sugar going up. And I love that because all I do is I make the rice and then I scoop it out onto my plate without warming it up. And you can actually warm it up just a little slightly, but I don't mind cold rice. And I get to eat my grains and I get to eat anything I want in, I, in the framework of my blood sugar control. And it gets to the point where you feel it in your body and you can look at the food and know what kind of effect that food is going to have on you once you know what your body feels like. Beautiful, Monica. Any final words on blood sugar and sleep? Yes, I want everybody to know that this is within their grasp and this is not a diet. This is not a restriction. This is just a way of eating real food to feel your best because when you can sleep, when you can rest, when you can get rid of anxiety and feel like you have a life that is full of energy, you can do anything and your, your life is not restricted when you're healthy. Where can people find you, Monica? Do share, um, where do you share further wisdom about blood sugar? So I have an account on Instagram. It's monica.paz.nourished. I am on Facebook at, as Nourish Functional Nutrition. And I also have a website at Nourish Functional Nutrition. A pleasure speaking with you today, Monica. An absolute pleasure. And thank you. Lots of love streaming from my heart to yours. And oh, I receive you gratitude for giving us your time today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you today, Deepa, and your listeners. Blood sugar balance is not complex. Maintaining a mantra of having fat, fiber and protein at every meal goes a long way in supporting great energy, mood and everything else. It is also very easy to slip into patterns of not being intentional and mindful about this. I encourage you to always look at your plate and ask yourself, where is the fat? Where's the protein and where's the fiber? As you do this, notice how your mood stabilizes, how sleep improves and how life just seems better. Have a great day. This podcast is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subject matter covered in the episodes. The podcast is not acting in the capacity of a doctor or a registered dietitian and is not rendering any professional healthcare or medical service. The information in the podcast is not intended as a substitute for medical advice or services or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. The advice and tools contained herein may not be suitable for your situation. Any medical questions regarding contraindications and cautions or any questions on whether or not to proceed with any practices provided in the show should be referred to qualified health professionals before adopting the same. The podcast specifically disclaims any responsibility for any liability, loss, risk, personal or otherwise which may be incurred as a direct or indirect consequence of the use of information from this podcast or the application adoption of any of the information provided.